I want to start really today by widening out this debate a little bit, and uh, it's got, I think, to some degree narrow, but I want to try and put this whole debate in context. I think that this is, in a sense, a part false debate uh, that we have been having in the UK for two reasons. Uh, the first is because the EU, I have always uh, come to believe, uh, has been a political project, first and last. And it seems to me only in the UK, and I want to come back to this, uh, do we persistently talk only narrowly and solely about the idea uh, that this is all about a thing called a marketplace and just access to a marketplace. Uh, and I want to come back to that. It's not what happens when you talk or debate uh, in other countries around uh, the European Union. And the second uh, bit of the debate, which is, what were the grounds, really, on which we were meant to be holding this debate? And I will come back and return to the Prime Minister's premise that he thought that the European Union wasn't working and it needed major overhaul and reform, uh, and he laid down some criteria for that. And the question really is, he said, that did we want to stay in a reformed European Union not did we want to stay in the European Union, because the indication uh, was that the European Union wasn't working. Now, my particular personal journey on this, uh, when I first came into uh, Parliament in 1992, I was faced with an immediate decision as to whether or not to vote uh, for the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, I made the mistake of reading it. I was told later on, uh, for all backbench politicians, never a good thing to read uh, government business. So I read it, uh, and uh, I just reached the conclusion myself that I didn't think that this... Uh, was what I had understood uh, my original vote uh, it, it, when we joined, and I voted to join the European Union, uh, that it was in those days the common market. And I thought this would take it further, having come out of the shadow and the back of uh, uh, the European uh, single market and through the uh, changes that took place in the previous treaty. And so I actually, all the way through, just simply said I wasn't in favour of leaving the European Union, I was in favour of somehow trying to get the change that was necessary in reforming it. And I think... In all accounts, I've always said that. But as I saw more and more treaties take place and more and more of this qualified majority voting taking more and more powers, I believe, away from national governments, moving from an intergovernmental uh, kind of structure to a much more supranational uh, and bureaucratic but central-driven uh, engine, uh, then I just felt progressively more and more that was it capable of reform. And the last straw was really needing to get that reform and not getting what I thought was necessary. So I reached the conclusion that it, we were better off leaving. So let me refer back to the reason why I think this debate, in a sense, uh, divides into uh, two false premises, in the sense that when uh, we set out to discuss this, we always discuss only the narrow end of it. See, when I was in Berlin last week, I went to debate uh, in Berlin uh, whether or not <clears throat> the UK should leave and what would happen afterwards. There were a number of German politicians there, another uh, economists from different uh, walks of life, and uh, there were a number of discussions, and I made a speech about why I felt that we were wanting to leave. And I was interested, really, because this was not something that they didn't want to talk about. In other words, when I said that this is a political project, that this has always been a process, a progression towards a time when we eradicated uh, the competing nation-state, uh, and that we would lead to eventually a kind of supranational federal, <coughs> federal union. And the point is that uh, I talked to them about somebody that they all knew, but very few people in this country have any idea about, a man called Altiero Spinelli. Uh, now, Mr. Spinelli is, uh, Spinelli is the unknown uh, character in uh, all of those great architects of where the European Union should go <laughs> here in the UK, he genuinely really uh, leaves everybody with a quizzical look on their face. But he was a very, very important man. He, in fact, was the real architect of the Single European Act, essentially, and of the Maastricht Treaty and the subsequent move. And it was his real drive that brought about the concept of serious extension and involvement of qualified majority voting. And he was very clear from the very beginning uh, as to what he saw Europe should be, and many people adhere to him. There is now a uh, a significant building in Brussels named after him. And I want to quote something that he wrote as early on as just around the time of the Second World War. It was his view of why uh, this process needed to engage and end where he felt it, it should. And I'll quote this. He said, If a post-war order is established in which each state retains its complete national sovereignty, the basis for a Third World War would still exist. 
Now, that, I think, is a very, very fine idea. It's a, a very clear idea. It doesn't take any spin or change. That is his view. That is the view of a number of people around uh, the continent of Europe, uh, that the real reason for uh, the Second World War particularly, but the uh, modern wars, was the concept that competing nation-states naturally led themselves in that extension of competition uh, to eventual military conflict. I can see that, but I do not agree with it. I think it is a misreading of what the problem really was. My view has been for some time that the real problem uh, was the absence of democracy and democratic institutions within many of those nation-states, deep-rooted democratic institutions that were able to see through uh, a democracy and the rule of law, even no matter how great and difficult were the problems. After all, you know, the experience of the UK and of America uh, were quite different from many of the continental European nations. You know, we face the same terrible problems with the Depression, the terrible problems of worklessness. In fact, it can be argued the UK got there earlier by their adherence to the gold standard. But nonetheless, uh, those, that anger, that genuine fear and worry uh, of lack of employment and lack of wages and all of those real deep and terrible conditions, people vented through the system and changed the governments. In America, they brought about Roosevelt and the New Deal. Uh, and in the UK, eventually Chamberlain uh, came to power and made changes as well here that started to move the economy back. Now, I don't say that they were perfect or that they managed magically to transform it, but I simply say that there is a genuine disagreement about the reason why we ended up at war. And my point about that is if you disagree about that, then you disagree, in essence, about what that grand plan was for the eventual solution to this, which is... Uh, the overall eradication of that competing nation-state. And my worry, uh, I, I guess, in all of this is that in seeking to eradicate that concept of intergovernmentalism and the nation-state as a, com a competing set of organisations, uh, you are beginning to achieve some of the things that they set out not to achieve and to avoid. You can begin to see through the disaster, I think, of the problems around the euro area, of the very high levels of unemployment and real problems uh, in places like Greece over the problems about having to repay their debts and the, the pressure that's been mounted upon them, you begin to see uh, organisations that you would not want to have seen or would have anticipated coming back uh, into uh, the European arena, such as the Front National and Golden Dawn and others, I don't need to name them all for you, but that is where I feel that goes. So that, I think, first and foremost, is that this has been a political project, and it is a debate that has very rarely ever been engaged here in the UK. We narrow it down to whether you want to be in the marketplace or you don't. It's all about trade. My point is it's not. If it was all about the economy then I think nations would have taken a very different view about the issues and the problems of the euro area and how to resolve those, even in the short and medium term, uh, because they don't, because it is part of a much bigger political drive. Why, for example, was Greece allowed into the euro in the first place when everybody knew uh, that actually uh, that their, uh, their GDP levels and their uh, levels of their economy were actually not as they were originally said to be? So that is the first point that I want to make in the course of this, that we do ourselves no favour when we engage in this in a completely narrow way. I think we need to understand the context uh, that there is an overarching view and a belief that this should be the case. The second part of the point that I wanted to make was that uh, the Prime Minister went away at Bloomberg and made a speech in which I said earlier on he maintained that the European Union was not working. And he gave a list of the areas that needed hugely to be reformed and changed uh, to be able to make it a working organisation uh, that matched the needs and aspirations, I think he said, of the peoples uh, who inhabit the various nations of Europe. I want to read them to you because I think it's worth reminding ourselves of how uh, large that ambition was and how great that concept of reform could have been. He wanted to talk about the devolving again of social and employment legislation back to the nations. 
He talked about an opt-out of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which we did have, we thought, uh, but had been taken away from us. A limit to the power of the European Court of Justice. Stop the wasteful moving of EU parliaments from Brussels to Strasbourg. Reform of the common agricultural policy. Uh, change to the structural funds. EU treaty change across the board. And in a second speech, he talked about border control and how we bring about a control to the levels of migration. But what we ended up with, I felt, after all of that and that grand aspiration, uh, was that, by and large, uh, the European Union uh, didn't really agree with him. And that became apparent as the Prime Minister set out to try and achieve uh, an arrangement that would allow him to be able to maintain, quite legitimately, uh, that we were debating whether to remain in a reformed European Union or whether to remain in the European Union uh, that he said was not working. Uh, and whatever you believe about what came back, and I believe that where it was fairly small beer, uh, uh, and particularly, I think, to have focused only or significantly on the idea that somehow the changes uh, to the way that the benefit system might work would somehow transform uh, the nature of the, uh, uh, of the migration issue, uh, I think was... Um, was hope uh, expanding itself beyond perhaps the limits that it should have done. And when it was all done, most of it is still undefined, and particularly in that same area. Uh, and I want to quote you, uh, which I'm sure you've all heard, but it's never a problem about re-quoting it, uh, from the Vice President of the European Parliament, uh, Count Lambsdorff, I think it was, who said, and I quote, when referring to the, what the Prime Minister referred to as the reformed European Union... He said, actually, it's not legally binding. The whole thing is nothing more than a deal hammered out down at the local bazaar. And he made it very clear that as and when this comes in front of the European Parliament, it would not anyway remain much as it was when it was discussed. And my point about all of that was that my concern, you know, if you want to remain and you believe passion, as I say, with what the whole original architecture of this is all about and the direction of travel, I absolutely applaud you for that. But if that is your belief, that's fine. But my view here was that we gave away for that something quite significant that allowed us, if anything, to at least protect some of our, what we do from the changes that might come uh, from within uh, the euro area. And that was the veto that we had over the changes within the euro area. Now, I was told endlessly by civil servants, don't go on about this because it's not really worth very much. Uh, genuinely, it's not. I know that the legal advice at the time when the prime minister vetoed that last treaty change, uh, they said it was around about 70% likelihood of success. So that's very powerful, by the way, when lawyers tell you that. But I was told subsequently, oh, no, don't worry about that. It's not that important. They'd just immediately take it to the court and you'd get overturned and <clears throat> you, it won't work again. But I was struck by the fact that when the European Union, when the Commission and others got down to kind of brass tacks with the Prime Minister and talked to him about what he wanted, they only really asked for one thing back in return. And I've done enough deals in business and worked out deals within government to know that... Uh, uh, a deal is about what works in both directions. They asked for one thing and one thing only. They asked for the veto back. Now, you tell me if they didn't think it was important to get the veto taken away from us rather than for us to be left with it. I think that tells you pretty much everything you need to know about what they think of the veto. It's powerful, it's strong, and it could and would have helped stop things that we think that they shouldn't have happened. So I think this is important. I think that process, therefore, of the question that was originally set, we were to vote on a reformed European Union. And judging on what that test was, I have to tell you, I cannot understand why uh, my government is now deciding that they won't vote to leave the European Union, because after all, that was the logical step for the test that the Prime Minister set us all. And this matters, of course, because... Uh, as the House of Commons showed through uh, statutory instrument regulations and even uh, main primary legislation, some 60% of our laws are now directly uh, derived from uh, the Commission uh, and are overseen now by the European Court of Justice, which, you know, to be quite frank uh, and to be fair, everybody in the European Union refers to this, that it is the Supreme Court 
on all matters to do with European, uh, the Aki communautaire, but of course as the Aki now uh, extends itself into so much of domestic policy, it is therefore supreme in a huge amount of what we do. Now, I was interested again uh, when asked about whether the European court was a supreme court, uh, I would put my hand up and say, yep, it is a supreme court, that's what it functions as, uh, but the Prime Minister and the government don't want to say that is the case. It is the case. Everywhere else in the European Union, uh, they admit it and accept it, and in many cases they think it's a good thing. Uh, I don't, but I do accept that it is actually true. It is the Supreme Court. I have no problem with saying it. And I think, therefore, the terms of the debate need to be set on that basis, which let's debate what is in reality there and what people really want rather than what we think we would like to see and what we hope for. And this as a result, means that, therefore, we have had to accept certain things, and this is what this debate now becomes about, that flow from that concept uh, of that overarching federal union, which is this uh, concept of open borders uh, with no possibility of change, uh, and that, of course, I believe has had big effects here in the UK. I don't think we've ever seen a time when we've seen the flow of migration uh, coming in uh, to the uh, United Kingdom in quite the way they have from the European Union, uh, most of the people coming in, uh, to be quite frank, I genuinely believe come to look for jobs. I don't for one moment believe <laughs> otherwise. There will obviously be one or two, and some I'm sure that don't, but I think the vast majority do come to look for jobs. My concern is that many of them, as been pointed out, uh, generally the majority are taking up low, skilled, low-paid jobs, and I think that's had effect on uh, the... Uh, the incomes of those on the lowest levels of earnings down at the low skilled end certainly has had the effect of depressing them, certainly when you take into consideration a cost of living rise as well. Uh, I think the bank is clear about that. You can debate by exactly how much, but I'm not going to go into the details about that, but I think the principle is there. And I think the scale of it is also uh, sizable enough to create problems and issues in particular communities, but across the board, that is to say, Migration, which is uncontrolled, <coughs> becomes difficult to assimilate, uh, and that in turn causes problems uh, as well. And so that lack of an ability to assimilate at a level and a speed that is available is actually, therefore, what causes uh, the major problems. And, uh, you know, Stuart Rose uh, himself said, although it's very difficult to figure out what more he said because he seems to have gone missing, but I do understand that he is the chairman of the Remain campaign, but when he was out and about uh, talking about this very early on, he did make the point that, of course, you know, what would happen is uh, that wages would go up for many in Britain if we left. He saw that as a bad thing. Uh, I actually think that is probably a good thing. But you know, at least we agreed on one thing, that that, I think, is likely to happen. Uh, because controlling migration means you control the numbers coming in and competing on those jobs and allow people, therefore, uh, to, uh, uh, to receive the kind of monies that they should and not be so much uh, at the whim uh, of uh, many unscrupulous employers. And the pressure's also not just on uh, the wages that we pay. The second area is, of course, in healthcare. There have been huge problems as a result of that un, uh, unrivaled scale of migration. GP registration has risen by 1.5 million in the last three or more years, I don't say by any means that this is all to do migration, but I think migration has a significant part to play with that. I think, again, with a &E attendances, risen from 14 to 22 million. Uh, there are obviously demographic issues in that, but migration, I think, is accepted, has played a large part in that. The number of schools having to be built has had to rise. Uh, that came out in the recent education report. And, and housing, I think the pressure on housing is perhaps almost the other part which has been felt most. Two-thirds of additional households uh, in the last 15 years have been headed by someone who was born abroad, and we've had to build the latest figures from Migration Watch, some 240 houses every day, just to stand still on the levels of demand that come uh, from people coming in uh, from outside, for the most part, uh, into the country. And the bit that I think is really interesting for younger people is that this has driven, actually, driven up the ratio uh, of earnings uh, to capital uh, when it comes to house purchase and even to rentals. And the last figure that I saw said that the house price ratio to earnings is 8.7 to 1. 
8.7 to 1. When I first bought a house, it was around about 3 to 3.5 to 1. And that means, and by the way, as I understand it, the latest figures that I saw showed that that's almost double what it is in the United States, which is a country that has a similar level of home ownership to us. So the pressures for those who aspire to home ownership also have to be considered uh, as we go forward in this debate. And that's why I want to say that when you look around at the threats uh, of where this is going, as the Eurozone itself continues with its deep malaise and problems, uh, with the very high levels of youth unemployment and adult unemployment, and many of those economies still fairly stagnant, and the governor of the Bank of England, the previous governor, saying that he thought and believed that the euro crisis uh, was not over yet uh, and was likely to get worse before it gets better. This is likely to create even further pressures. Already we're beginning to see a significant numbers of people coming from all over the European Union uh, to work here. As I say, if I was them, I would do exactly the same thing. They are seeking work. That's what they want to do. The question is really, what scale can we assimilate and how many can we take? And this is really why I want to make the point that control of your borders is not about saying we don't know to migration. It's about saying we want to be able to set the scale and the speed at which we can bring people in. And we also want to have a view about really what we bring in to improve the quality of the economy and of our way of life. We need to be able to have a say about how that works. Do we need greater skills in engineering or software or in the health service or whatever? This brings me really on to the business and the economy, a few facts and figures about this, which I want to make the point about, which is, you know, I've heard a lot about business people saying and organizations that we mustn't leave the European Union, it would cause a disaster for their businesses, the market that matters most to them and everything else, and I'm sure when they say it, uh, they really believe it. But I think it's quite interesting to go and have a look at actually the... um, the way that they work their figures out in terms of the way that they invest. Always useful to see the balance sheet of a business because it tells you where they think they're going to be doing more business in the future years and what they think they will make of that. And it's quite interesting to look at these foreign investments from the UK into the European Union. And what you come to the conclusion is British business has been stripping money out of the European Union since before the, the big recession in 2007-8. In fact, it had been falling perpetually almost from the time that we joined. But what was interesting is it accelerated, and more importantly, it went negative. And so what actually they've been doing is taking uh, money out. The net dis- disinvestment in the last six years is just under £80 billion pounds from UK business in the European Union. And that's declined by over 100 billion uh, from 2008 to 2014. So the amount of money uh, that was invested has gone down by over 100 billion. And earnings from foreign direct investments in the EU, which is quite an important point, for British business have declined from 37.5 billion just at the time of the start of the recession to 15.8 billion uh, in 2015. So their balance sheet tells you that actually they are no longer seeking to invest their money or their new money there. And when you ask where they're putting it, you will see that they are placing it hugely in the United States. We are the first or the second, it oscillates, uh, highest investor in the United States and in the emerging markets. I'm sure that makes common sense. Uh, I'm absolutely certain it does. Uh, But the reality is, therefore, that their view of the marketplace is that this marketplace is not a marketplace that is set to grow or is to be a flourishing marketplace and not one that will yield them any significant return for their investment. So all those exports that we talk about and the balance where we actually uh, have more sold to us than we sell to the European Union is compounded by the fact that actually British business is looking elsewhere for where it is going to develop and be profitable in the times to come. So I really want to conclude in this process by just bringing back to what I think are the key elements that I have been talking about today. At the essence of it all, it, I believe, comes down to who governs you. The simple principle that I think uh, democracy is all about, 
Where do you see that government placed? Where do you see those laws and regulations made? And how accountable are you for that? And how do you account to the British people uh, for what their concerns and worries are if you are always looking over your shoulder uh, to a Supreme Court that is not yours, or for that matter, to an organization, a bureaucracy that makes most of your laws that you then have to take. And even if you have what you say is influence, uh, but that influence only extends to the point when you have to vote, and every time that the UK has voted in 72 occasions, 72 times they have lost. And by the way, I've been into these councils enough to tell you that if you talk to the Foreign Office much, uh, they will always tell you not to vote, never to drive it to a vote, because it always upsets people. So there are many, many times when uh, very ministers want to think something to a vote, but they say don't bring it to a vote, because losing it only makes us look like a laughing stock. So my sense is that we are really <coughs> facing a decision as to whether or not we want to be tugged along after this vote behind, reluctantly behind, a European Union bound on a course which many of them believe is the right thing, which is the eradication of the competing nation-state and the creation of a supranational federal union. For many, it is a strong belief, and I applaud them for it. I don't share it, and I don't believe the British people share it either. But I would rather us vote to leave and no longer be that country that spends its time arguing and getting angry and being the awkward one that gets eventually, after the argument, tugged along in that direction, even though we moan and complain about it. I think it would be far better for us to leave and have a much better, more benign relationship with our friends and our compatriots in the European Union and beyond the European Union. And the issues around control of migration come from this refusal to accept that they will never reform or change that core principle of what it is to have freedom of movement in the European Union. It is a game being played out. The idea somehow that there will be more reform to come, I think, is the, another one of those pipe dreams. You know, I've been around long enough in politics to remember when John Major came back from Maastricht and he said we have reached the high water... Well, actually, it was Douglas Heard, but I think they both agreed about this. We've reached the high water of European federalism. And it was game, set and match to the British. High water <coughs> mark of European federalism. Well, I must say, the water has gone on rising ever since. And it continues to rise and will continue to rise because that is what the structure that Spinelli and his team put together. In other words, you would never be dependent on elected politicians, for they have to go to their electorates, and their electorates might do perverse things and complain about things they do not like. So you need unelected people who never have to refer back to their constituents. They will keep the flame, and they will drive it, and the court will act as its ratchet. And there are real threats. You know, when you vote on the 23rd of June, it isn't a, a choice between a, as I've been told, a leap in the dark and some benign and wonderful nirvana or experience that we know where it's going to be, it's all going to be okay, everyone is getting along just fine. When you vote <coughs> on the 23rd of June, you vote to take one of two decisions, either to vote to take back control and to deal with the risks and the things that will happen that are happening around the world right now and will happen to the UK, but do it from a UK perspective with a government accountable to British people for what happens to the UK. Or you do it on the basis of a government that constantly has to look over its shoulder to a bureaucracy that directs and are 27 other nations who may disagree with you completely and make your compromises such that what you are doing for your country does not actually come as what you think should happen at the time to them. And down the road, by the way, in this benign organisation, is major risk. You know, the euro area, as the previous governor of the Bank of England said, is facing continuing crisis. Somebody said, oh, well, areas are growing now. Well, yeah, but you know just how much money 
has the European Central Bank now dumped across Europe to try and get some of that growth. And by the way, I saw the other day there was a debate about whether or not they should be helicoptering money to get even more cash out there, that is, cash just given to people to spend. Now, quantitative easing has happened in many of the countries, including this. But the real point about it is, don't confuse what you're seeing in those countries. I think, as in any way, real growth. Uh, what you've actually got in front of you is the continuing problem of that sclerosis that is the euro. But alongside that, you have real threat about what uh, is coming down the tracks in terms of regulations. You know, the solvency directive, which is still there, by the way, uh, an ex-compatriot of mine in the Department of Work and Pensions said it had been settled. It hasn't. It's been parked for further reviews about how it might be implemented, but it will come back again. I suspect probably not till after the referendum. I don't know why I feel that I should say that, but I think it's likely to be. The harmonization directive, which will affect insurance companies quite directly. And the five presidents report makes it very clear, if you didn't, that what I've been saying about the political direction of Europe is absolutely clear, that the European Union is bound on a deeper, tightening fiscal responsibility and more to follow because it is what they want. And at least they're honest about it. I don't moan about it. I simply recognize that that is what many want. And if that's what they want, uh, I think that maybe they will get it. I want to make one small statement about myself. I don't believe this debate is about whether, you know, we like Europe or not. I love Europe. I'm a European. I studied out in Italy. My family have worked most of their lives in Italy. I've done business all over Europe. I've spent as a politician in Europe. I'm passionate about many of the diversities of culture, language, the incredible renaissance of arts, etc., that take place. It's a wonderful continent. It's brilliant in many regards, possibly the most brilliant continent in the world. So I'm very keen to be part of that continent. So I don't believe we're leaving Europe. We're leaving the European Union. And I believe it is going to do the worst for that great continent, a homogenization of all of those great talents and skills, and a kind of bureaucratic nightmare that is to follow, with people's interests being put to the back burner as they trail along behind the desire for a political project whose time has, if it ever came, has certainly now gone in the 21st century. So I want to support Europe, but I think the only way we can do that now, knowing they will not change and will not reform, is to leave the European Union. And by doing so, I hope many countries in Europe will ask themselves a very similar question. Why? Why do we have to continue down this road? Why can't we accept that we're friends, cooperating, trading, that we could do more intergovernmentally, we come together when we need to, but get on with it when we don't? So I think, rather than reigniting all those tensions that we tried to get rid of many years ago, as you're seeing around the continent, I want my country to vote to leave the European Union for its own sake, but also to send a message to the other countries in the European Union that it really is time to change. Thank you.